Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, The Current State of LGBTQI Plus Rights in Costa Rica, Barbados, Haiti, and Guatemala, sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University, as well as the Gender and Policy Concentration at SIPA, ELOS, the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia, and last but definitely not least, Human Rights Campaign. I'm Stephanie Greppo, Director of Capacity Building. We are so happy to welcome you today and we hope that you're all doing well. And I would really like to thank Jean, who is moderating this event today. We are slowly coming back to normal here in the Human Rights Advocates Program. This year's cohort, Half Hybrid, and so happy to say they are with us now in New York City. We're slowly moving to everything being back in person in New York City. So to this cohort, I want to give a big thank you because they really have gone through a lot with us, especially in trying to get them here. So, so happy today to turn this over to our four advocates and to Jean, thank you. Well, that is a perfect way to begin <clears> the <throat> panel by unmuting myself. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's really, it's an honor to once again be partnering with the HREP program at Columbia University to introduce and to engage and to learn from the amazing um, advocates from around the world that this program brings together. Uh, once again, we are virtual, but the good news is that probably means that more people can join us online. So wherever you are um, in the world, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And the purpose of this session is to really get to know each other better, to learn from these amazing advocates more about the work that they're doing in their own countries, the challenges that they face, and then to see how from each of them, um, how the work that they are doing impacts um, more widely the region and LGBTQI plus rights around the world. So we very much hope that you in the audience will engage with us. Please ask your questions. If somebody says something that piques your interest or you don't quite understand or you want to build on, just pop the note right there in the chat and um, uh, we will um, do our best to try to answer that. So. My name is Jean Friedberg. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Director of Global Partnerships at the Human Rights Campaign. For those of you who might not know HRC, we are based in Washington, DC. We are the largest uh, LGBTQ plus advocacy organization in the United States. We are proud to say we have more than 3 million members and supporters around the country and around the world. Uh, we have been around for more than 40 years now, helping to drive the movement for equality uh, in this country and increasingly working with advocates around the world. Our global program is small, but we are growing. Um, we work with a network of partners and advocates around the world who we are proud to call part of the HRC family. We now um, number about 180 folks in 90 countries. Um, Roanne on this call is um, one of our amazing global innovators who has been engaging with us now for the last number of years. Um, and now, of course, everybody else gets to join that the family as well. We, um, so we support advocates through capacity building, through exchange of ideas, through partnerships in multiple ways, we bring folks together, we convene in um, regional and international settings, and we offer programs that um, help us learn from each other. So working with advocates like this is part of what we do. Um, and so I'm thrilled to, why don't we just get straight to it? I'm going to ask everybody to just very briefly introduce themselves, talk, explain a little bit who they are and what they do. We are going to keep this event with to the hour. I know everybody on this call is busy. You all have lots to do. And we very much appreciate and value the time that you have taken to be with us today and to share um, 
and to come and share with us for the for the next hour. So why don't I just hand it over to this amazing group? Let's start with you, Danielle or Danny, as I think you also <laughs> call yourself. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're up to? So I come from. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Right, sorry. Uh, so I come from Guatemala and I have worked many years as an advocate, but also as a journalist. I started my career as a journalist and I'm currently the coordinator of the LGBT reporting network. We uh, train and help media and journalists across all the Latin American region. And for over three years, we have trained more than 120 journalists in a fairer, more just coverage of LGBT issues across the region. Uh, so I've been doing all that work and also a lot of campaigning and uh, strategic litigation to get access for more rights in Guatemala. So it's very, I'm very excited to be here. Wonderful. Well, welcome, Danny, and thank you. Um, let's see, Rowan, why don't we go to you? Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Rowan Mohammed. My pronouns are she, her. I am originally from the Southern Caribbean islands of Trinidad and Tobago, but I have been based in Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean for the past 11 years. And <clears throat> sorry, um, I'm an LGBTQI plus activist, but also a feminist. Um, and I've been involved in LGBTQ activism uh, for about the past decade. And in Barbados, I am the founder and director of an organization called She Barbados which stands for Sexuality, Health and Empowerment. And it's a feminist LGBTQ organization which specifically focuses on the discrimination and the marginalization of queer women and trans and non-binary people in Barbados in particular, uh, because these people tend to sit at the intersection of patriarchy, homophobia, but also misogyny. Um, and there are a lot of specific issues that come with carrying all of those different identities. Um, particularly around service provision. So our organization um, has uh, an element where we provide access to services, uh, particularly around sexual and reproductive health and rights um, for our populations and communities. And I'm also the coordinator of Pride in Barbados. And I coordinated our first Pride in 2018 and then again in 2019, and hopefully again this year, um, if COVID allows. Uh, but yeah, that's about it for me for now. Thank you. Thanks, Rowan. Lots of follow-up questions arising, I am sure. Um, Dominique, let's hear from you a little bit about you and what you're doing in Haiti. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dominique Seville. I'm from Haiti, representing an institution named UTLA, um, a trans organization of Haiti. We work solely with transgender persons in providing them support uh, in terms of um, mental health issues or SOGI and also we try to provide advocacy for gender justice and GBV. Uh, we also try to support them in terms of uh, getting their gender identity uh, transformation uh, and so far we are really trying to do that but it's not that easy. Uh, I don't know if many people know about AT. There's no um, justice system that recognizes transgender persons. So it is pretty difficult for us to really provide the support that is necessary. But so far, we've been doing um, the best that we can to surround them and help them in ways that the constitution or the country does not. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And yes, of course, our hearts go out to you and all the people of Haiti. We know that this is the last few years have not been easy for you and your country. And um, we we know and we're aware and we just want to be sure that you you know that we stand with you through all of these challenges. Um, so let's move to Costa Rica and let's hear a little bit from Larissa and the work that you are doing over there. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Larissa Arroyo Navarrete. I use uh, the pronouns she and her. 
I'm a human rights uh, lawyer I'm, that works mostly on gender and diversities. And even though I have worked with uh, multiple national and regional organizations um, to achieve a legal and political changes, um, I see myself more like a feminist than a very uh, visible bisexual activist from Costa Rica. And I'm the founder of um, an NGO called Asociación Ciudadana Acceder. And uh, from um, I was uh, the director for about six years. And um, the main reason to, to do that was to have an NGO dedicated to promoting a strategic action for human rights to strengthen the leadership of women and uh, LGBT LGBTIQ plus uh, people, but specifically and especially bisexual, lesbian, non-heterosexual women, non-binary people. And also I have been um, the legal advisor and member of uh, another, not NGO, but like a group that is called Frente por los Derechos Igualitarios. And we also work for uh, equal marriage, uh, among other things. And in fact, we, we were able to, to achieve that goal. So I'm delighted to be here and thank you so much, Dean. Thank you, Larissa. Um, you know, a lot of themes are emerging immediately from, um, from this conversation, um, which I'm making note of, because I think we can also look across each of these countries a little bit at how you, you're dealing with some of the, the challenges over there. So in this next, sort of this first section, I, I actually want to ask each of you a little bit about, uh, in your own country, what is some of the areas of progress that you've been able to make? What, of course, the challenges um, that hold you back? And then also a little bit, if you don't mind, about how your work fits in with the broader LGBTQ movement in your country and how your organization connects to um, folks that are working perhaps in other areas as well, like trans issues or HIV or um, you know, media and so on and so forth. So uh, broaden, you know, so talk specifically and then also help us broaden the frame a little bit to understand um, your situation. So uh, mixing it up a little bit, why don't we, let me see. Um, let me start with uh, Dominique if you would like to go first on this section. Um, that is uh, an interesting question. Um, uh, first as background, uh, OTA is one of the first institution, not to say the, the, the only one institution that is working with transgender persons. And um, we have come with the idea of having such association because uh, at the beginning in 2000, 14, 15, and so we've realized that all the help has been focusing on homosexual persons and institution that are uh, LGBTIQ institution, but that are mostly led by homosexual men. And the issue of transgender person was disregarded a lot. And um, we have uh, tried to make, to do advocacy regarding that issue, but it has not gone too far. So we think that the only way to really put a light on the issues of transgender person was to build an institution that will really accompany them and support them in terms of um, gender-based violence or justice issues. And so far, uh, OTA has been doing great, but it is pretty difficult to have a network uh, of institution that really uh, want to in, get involved in what we are doing. And uh, we have realized that um, not only the, the, the global world is seeing trends differently, but also inside of the community, the LGBTI community, uh, many of our fellows do not understand what is it to be trans per, a trans person. And especially in institution or countries that has colonial backgrounds such as AG. It is pretty difficult to see uh, transgender people with uh, their own um, their own uh, needs and 
what would be said that is really different from the other LGBTIQ, the LG, LBTIQ community. And so far, we have had support from uh, many institutions, uh, specifically institution that works with uh, women, but it is quite often an, an, uh, an issue because in Haiti, as soon as you start working with some institution that are LGBTIQ led, uh, you are, they have the tendency to put you in the same box. Like it's because the institution is accepting gay people or lesbian people. So the network is not that easy. But uh, since we've started working with NUDE, uh, with a project called Being LGBT in the Caribbean, the Bleak Project, it has shed uh, another light in uh, how um, different we are and how the networking is really important, especially when we are trying to really connect with the government and see what can be done in terms of um, uh, juris juridistic uh, panel so that they could really build something that could help them and focus on the health or also the representation, the juristic with representation and transgender persons when it comes to identity uh, in the in the country. And also we have tried to uh, do network with institutions that work in terms of uh, health issues, but mostly HIV positive persons. And uh, that was the first thing that, not to say the only thing or the only way to really get involved in human rights uh, uh, advocacy issues and things are starting to shift but uh, we have to be patient I guess and also we have to really double our efforts to let people know that um, uh, HIV issues is really important because it is uh, it was a pandemic and it is still striving nowadays but we have to really uh, embrace the fact that without human rights uh, institution that are really uh, orienting people in a way uh, to see people, human being as human being, it is really difficult like to really um, find a way to, to uh, focus on issues like elf or transgender issues or even lesbian or bisexual persons. Yeah, thanks, Dominique. I mean, of course, you speak to the toughest challenge that we all have, right, which is changing hearts and minds. However hard we work on the legal and advocacy side, we need to you know, change the culture around us. And that is tremendously, that is the job. And it's very hard indeed. Um, we'll come back, I have some follow-up questions, um, but let's just keep um, going around the room for now. Um, Marissa, why don't you talk to us a little bit about Costa Rica? Yes, uh, well, um, I think, um, most of the, the issues we had to advance in uh, LBGTIQ plus rights are quite similar from um, to the other countries. And um, it goes beyond like a political um, will to achieve like a change in the legal frame. And I would like to address especially the, the lack of um, agreement between all the groups um we were we are <laughs> we still are so diverse we are not a homogeneous group we do not understand that we have different needs and it was um some sort of a very hard a process to understand that. So for example, when we uh, started working on equal marriage, we just did that. So it was like, we couldn't think about any other problem or issue. And um, I think at the beginning, we could not understand that it was just more about economical interests. And we were not talking about violence. We were not talking about trans people. And at some point, we decided that we needed to go forward and to, to change that. So we decided, for example, that it was uh, important to support trans people and the trans movement in Costa Rica, but no, not to take the leadership. Because usually the leaderships are more about male gay voices, and I think that's a very common thing all, all around the world. Mm -hmm. So at some point, that is why we decided to um, 
have like another space to as to just work on um, the leadership of uh, women and non-binary people that could identify as bisexual, lesbian, uh, non-heterosexual, and all the the uh, sexual orientations that might not be in that uh, particular category of uh, male uh, uh, gay voices. And it was, um, I think it was very, very hard because even uh, some of our members uh, were against like the, the figure of uh, marriage. So it was like, how can we uh, try to work on equality if we are refusing this um, unique uh, figure that we have already uh, in our uh, frame, um, legal frame. Um, so it was kind of um, a very hard there. And also we had to um, think about um, the cultural differences and of course the religious situation in Costa Rica because we are a Catholic uh, country. We are, uh, the state and the church are not separated. So that means that even the legal frame incorporates a religious part and um, it, it provides some kind of uh, um, funds to the church that of course was uh, trying to um, like stop all the advances in um, human rights, especially for LGBTQ plus uh, people. So I think um, um, everyone here might <laughs> relate to, to that kind of a situation, but and maybe um, later we can talk about this, but I believe that it was, uh, the the way we were able to have an agreement and to overcome that um, differences and all those diversities that we were able to achieve not one but many goals in the past but maybe I can talk about that uh, later thank you Dean thanks Larissa um Rowan yeah, there's so much that uh, that Larissa and Dominique have both shared that I feel um, is applicable to my context in Barbados as well. Um, and I do think that in order to understand some of the contextual issues that we're facing in Barbados currently, we need to have an understanding and awareness of what has happened in our past, because we do have such a complicated past given our history with British colonialism and the impact that that has really had on sexual and gender minorities today. And we still feel the brunt of that, particularly with the amount of uh, fundamental religious uh, pushback that we're facing um, when it comes to LGBT rights and not even just LGBT rights, but the rights of everybody who's at the margins um, and represents diverse communities. Uh, so Barbados was colonized by the British and they did impose um, laws which criminalize uh, same-sex intimacy. And we still have those laws today. So I think that's one of our biggest issues that we're facing as a community. And it's not even just about the criminalization of these sex acts, because that's what it criminalizes, sex acts, and not necessarily our identities. But uh, what that does, and the fact that these laws exist, it creates a, a precedence where people feel that they can treat LGBT people as second class citizens. And that is, has been one of the biggest challenges for our community, um, feeling as though we're othered um, in our own society, which we contribute to, which we've always contributed to. Um, and I bring this point up often that uh, prior to colonization, um, many indigenous communities really celebrated, uh, you know, gender and sexual diversity, the people who occupied our land um, before colonization. And even some of our ancestors who came from Western Africa and were enslaved through colonization, they came from many cultures which celebrated gender and sexual diversity. Um, so now we're in a situation whereby many people from the global north, um, particularly like US, Canada, UK and other European countries sort of see uh, the Caribbean as primitive or backwards um, and feel as if they set the precedent or the standard by which we need to adhere to, um, to mark our progress without really understanding the history of why 
Um, there's so much uh, tension when it comes to LGBTQI issues within our region. Um, and I feel like that what that does is that it really erases a lot of the efforts and the work and the celebration of our identities that's been happening within the region um, for many, many decades. Uh, so it's important that, that uh, Dominique raised uh, the issue of HIV because I feel as though that really did a, a great job at setting back the movement within the 80s and the 90s um, because it instilled a lot of fear in people and we still see that fear today. And I still think that that fear is a driving factor um, for people excluding LGBTI people um, because similarly what, to what Larissa mentioned, um, we're a very Christian country and there's not a big separation of church and state. So we feel like a lot of people um, within institutions, whether it be healthcare institutions, within parliament, um, within the police service, they hold very true these uh, fundamentalist Christian values that are really driven by fear. Um, and we see that in the way that LGBT people are able, even able to just uh, access services within our country. Um, so I think those are some of the biggest challenges that we are facing, uh, but there's been a lot, a lot of progress, um, particularly within the past 10 years, so when I began advocacy in 2011, um, I co-founded an organization called Be Glad. And at the time that was the only LGBT organization on the island. Um, and we're very proud because it was led by two young queer women. And it became really evident to us that um, even though the movement was so dominated by the conversation, of cis gay men and HIV, that queer women and trans people have always been on the front lines advocating for all of our rights and pushing to make change happen. Um, and as I began to get deeper into LGBTI movement building, but also feminist work, I realized that there was such a huge fragmentation between these two movements, because quite often the LGBTI movement focuses on the experiences of cis gay men and the feminist movement would focus on the experiences of cis straight women. And there's a whole population of people, queer, trans and non-binary people that just end up being uh, left behind and slipping through the cracks, even though quite often we're the ones that are doing the work. And this is why I began my organization, She Barbados, um, because I found it necessary to have a space which particularly focused on our interests um, and our advocacy. And I mean, even something as simple as HIV or not as simple as HIV, but something as uh, as visible as the issue of HIV um, is so focused on the experiences of cis gay men. Um, but for example, in Barbados, we know that 51% of the people who are living with HIV are women, um, but everybody just assumes that all of these women are straight. How many of the women who are living with HIV and continue to contract HIV are LBQ women? What about trans people? Where are trans men included in this? Where are trans women included in this in these statistics? Um, and there's a real lack of clear data and evidence around our experiences. Um, so one of the main focuses of our organization has also been research because people usually need to have data and evidence to validate um, our experiences, which is unfortunate, um, but it's necessary. So I think collecting that data and evidence of our experiences, particularly around um, the issues that we face because of our gender identity and our gender. Um, that's been one of our major priorities and also pushing back against all of this religious rhetoric that has been um, really dominant within the past few years. And it was really great to be able to participate in a conference recently that HRC, not recently, but in 2019 that HRC had, um, which spoke about uh, engaging faith-based allies. And that's been a really, really successful strategy for us to engage with people of faith who are allies to our community. Um, because the ones who are in opposition aren't the majority, but they're just the loudest. Um, and I feel like I can speak for the entire hour. So <laughs> I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Rowan. Now you raised so many uh, challenges that I think really are common to everybody um, and we can come back and look try to unpack some of them um danny you want to yes of course. add your challenges <laughs> into the mix <laughs> so i'll start just by uh sending everyone uh the link to you know to get a sense of the latest law in guatemala and basically what happened is that um 
we, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the Congress passed by a massive approval, a law that criminalized LGBT identities. And it did it in a really subtle way with education, kind of in a similar way we're seeing at some of the states in the United States. But it, it was a big challenge because he did it in the Women's Day, you know, March 8th, um, kind of like to protect this thought related uh, and this all, all this anti-gender agenda that we've seen across different countries happening and fueled by a religi a religious uh, narrative, but also by some sort of like anti-democratic, almost neo-fascist uh, ways. Um, so that's really challenging. Uh, and even though that law uh, faced a lot of challenges and it didn't really go through being formally approved and implemented, um, it shows us that our leaders or our political leaders had an agenda and a common agreement against LGBT identities. So just to, to clarify, it, uh, it was a lot of, um, it, it made a lot of, of noise that it had a prohibition of seismic same-sex marriage, but we don't have same-sex marriage. But something that did was, for example, stating that the state couldn't defend LGBT identities as normal, um, that heterosexuality it was the only normal family value that it could be stated. And this applied for education and other more structural aspects, maybe that that specific uh, rights in a way, or, or, or you know, we don't have marriage, so marriage is not that big of a boss for us. But having our identities uh, being criminalized at education and at state um, responses in formal settings, that really set us back in a way. So that's the latest that has happened. But to go back and understand a bit of Guatemala, we need to understand that Guatemala, in fact, is really diverse. We have a large indigenous population and we live with different nations trying to get sense and make a country, right? So I think that that tension really fuels our living. And also we live in a time, we, we had a really big civil war, 36 years. So we live really in a culture of silence. And at times I do this joke that uh, even though there's a big closeted culture in Guatemala, it's not just the LGBT people that are closeted. You know, we like, we, we, we are afraid of speaking up. We are afraid, we, we have this, historically um, oppressive culture. So it's really hard, you know, to be forward thinking mm -hmm. and to fight for rights in Guatemala because you you always get this sense of resistance and of, of, of the past. So, so I think Guatemala has done a lot of progress in these um, topics, but we've seen it being challenged at this moment. And another thing that I wanted to, to talk about was how this idea of gay fear is always played out in politics and how our identities are you know, used uh, as a card at the game every time that they want to do something else. So it's being proven and I, I'm writing about it profoundly that how at really specific anti-democratic moments, gay fear or LGBT fear in a way, you know, there's not a better term, but has been historically used in Guatemala to suppress um, and also to, to advance a really co-opted state agenda. We had a big anti-corruption movement in 2015. It was really famous Guatemala because our president quit uh, because of the pressure. But they use that anti-gay rhetoric or anti-LGBT rhetoric, I'm sorry, but gay fear is the, the term in English, but we need a better term, I'll use LGBT fear, um, to address this uh, and suppress uh, uh, anti-corruption um, international body that was helping us in this state. Uh, and also uh, one year ago, uh, when the main anti-corruption prosecutor was fired and expelled, almost expelled and criminalized from the country, our president passed a bill to recognize families and the institution of family, which basically, you know, alienates LGBT um, people, but also it, 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 it basically states that, you know, heterosexuality is the only valid way of being. 
And this is not just a challenge for LGBT people. There's a lot of families that don't fit, you know, that standard model of a male and a female. So, so I think that it's really challenging to see how non-LGBT people have to believe in this, you know, and, and the, the challenges that we see in this. So, so in these past five years, we've seen how corruption has used uh, this rhetoric against LGBT identities um, to pass on laws, to pass on in, uh, public policy, and other things that they're just using to basically surpass our rights, but also to to benefit from corruption. And I think that's something we need to address because at times um, when we talk about LGBT rights, and I think we all, all have been through this, they're like, oh, let's go to the health department because it's HIV, or let's go to, uh, and it's kind of like put in a separate position and it's not talking a more general and you know holistic way as human rights for everyone. And I think that's really a challenge that we also face, we need to be, aware and talk and be more involved in how our rights or the rights of this specific group not only help this group, but help societies be better and how we are an asset for society. So I think that that sums it up, but uh, we can continue to talk more because there's a lot of things that, and, and this couple of weeks that we've been here together, we, we realize how the situations in our country can connect, but also how um, the challenges that we face, we need to be creative and aware of our contexts. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for your incredibly insightful uh, remarks here. I mean, one of the things that's striking me that, you know, is common in what all of you have said is, you know, we're not a homogenous group. Um, we are, however, bound together by societal forces larger than us, right, which use our various identities to mount a unified attack against us. So, you know, Guatemala, as Danny just talked about, has been in the news not in a good way with this law that they passed um, last week. Um, you know, all of you spoke about the challenges that you face in your own organizations, finding the path that you're working on but doing it obviously in the context where this our broader community faces tremendous challenges um, brought about by the role of the church. Goodness me, so much to talk about there. Um, you know, societal, or, I mean, homophobia and transphobia as a political weapon um, often stood up around election times and other ways to mobilize people against us. Um, pressure for, on us when we make progress forward, the opposition finds ways to um, come together to push back against that pressure. I mean, there's so many um, big issues around how we as individual organizations, as how we carve out the work that we do, but do it in the context, working with people in, the, in our broader community. Um, there's a couple of specific questions um, that I actually want to ask, but I'd like actually to ask all of you very briefly. Um, a, a friend of ours on the chat here from Miami wanted to know a little bit more in Haiti about what is the framework for trans folks? Do you have legal protections at all? Is there any possibility of gender market change? And actually, since this is a huge, obviously, area of concern for all of us, no matter what part of the work that we are doing, um, and, you know, coming from this understanding that uh, as, you know, whatever advocacy we do, we need to also continually be aware of the, you know, the most marginalized within our communities, which is often uh, trans people and in the US trans women of color, for instance. Um, so I, I am curious whether each of you can just speak a little bit about the state of trans rights uh, in your own country. But let's start with you, Dominique, since the question came to you. Yes, uh, I've been reading the question and um, the... I will start by saying that legal framework uh, in Haiti regarding like specific to any marginalized 
a group does not exist. Even for the women, it's pretty difficult. And they have been trying, the human rights activists, the feminists have been trying for a long time to create the possibility to have um, laws, specific laws regarding marginalizing uh, groupment specifically for women. But so far they have been not that successful. So this is to answer that it is in, a, in, in the light of that, it is pretty difficult for a transgender person to have any bills whatsoever that will, will specific, be specific to their needs and what they are looking for as um, legal framework that recognize them. And for gender markers, I could say that um, institutions from the government side have been trying to put in place some uh, kind, I won't say a recognition, but some kind of uh, ways to identify certain person of the trans community, but it only focuses on the male. The male, why? Because they, they've been working in the framework of HIV, not in the framework of human rights institution that are trying to acknowledge the right of any marginalized person, specifically for transgender community. And uh, so far, the only legal framework that we could rely on are the convention and the treaties that, are, that the government have, been, have signed for many years. But even though they did sign it, that doesn't mean that they do apply it in the in country. It is, and all the frame, legal framework that we could say that is in a certain way advantaging us and like we take advantage of that because anyway, we are citizens, Asian citizens and we pay taxes. We do have uh, documentation that uh, state us as Asians and that is it. Uh, as Asian, we are entitled to certain, um, to certain uh, access of justice, right, and uh, health, but that is it as citizens. But as Mora mentioned, it's most time for marginalized government. They see us as second class citizens, which means that uh, yes, we are Haitian citizens, but we do not have access of these, and nobody really cares about that. Only institutions that are working in the framework of human rights, and that's why we always encourage uh, grassroots uh, organizations to uh, provide certain support in terms of human rights um, tools, and most grassroots institutions even even before they will they they will be focusing on HIV issues or mental issues. I won't say mental issues. I'll say health issues. It's only now that mental issues, mental health issues, is becoming uh, really widespread and something that everybody wants to really put uh, forward. But uh, before, most institutions were only focusing on HIV, and now they realize that without the framework of human rights and recognizing human rights for everybody, it is pretty difficult to uh, come to a point where HIV would be the least of our problems. So now they are trying to put, to put forward some, some kind of um, support so that can happen. But so far, there, there is no legal framework that recognizes. Thanks, Dominique. Um... Let's just yeah go around the room, Rowan in Barbados. Yes, no. Yeah, I think this is a great question and, I, and something that uh, we should speak about deliberately. So thanks for raising it, Jean. Um, I think it's important to just note that in Barbados, Black trans women birthed the LGBTQ plus movement um, for a long time and for decades and decades. Uh, they were the only ones who were brave enough to be visible and advocate uh, for all of us, not just trans issues, but for all of us. Um, so in the 60s and 70s, before the HIV uh, epidemic happened, um, there was a huge national pageant called the Queen of the Bees pageant in Barbados, where uh, Black trans women would participate in this pageant and this show, and it used to attract like national audiences. And then um, as 
the HIV epidemic happened um, and a lot of fears started happening that dwindled and people really began demonizing them, but that didn't stop them from occupying space. Um, and it's so interesting because black trans women are the most marginalized group within LGBT um, persons in Barbados, but they've always been the ones who are most active, most visible, um, and like unafraid to just claim space for themselves. Uh, so the first organization in Barbados that was uh, focused on LGBTQ issues was founded in the 90s, and it was called United Gays and Lesbians Against AIDS Barbados, but it was started by a trans woman um, named Dee Dee Winston, and she's still fighting for LGBTI rights today. Um, and over the past few years, there have been so many organizations that have popped up. Uh, so, for example, there's one called Butterfly Barbados, which is led by another Black trans woman um, named Raven Gill. Um, currently, there's a case before the ISCHR, um, which is challenging uh, the criminalization of same-sex intimacy. And that was brought forward by a Black trans woman named Alexa Hoffman. Um, and there's an organization called Seed Barbados, which is led by another Black trans woman, Davina um, Emmanuel, and that focuses on providing services and um, just like life skills uh, to trans youth who are living within um, urban areas. And I think that just says a lot to the power that um, trans people have and the resilience. Um, but it's sad that a lot of the time their stories are really just like focused by stories of trauma. Um, I think there's so much more to trans people and their experiences and their lives and the trauma that, that they experience. I think it's really important to center trans joy. Um, and I find it sad that even though within Barbados, we're making progress when it comes to LGBTQI plus issues, but quite often we see trans people being left behind. Um, so within our legal framework, there's no recognition of trans identities. It's very binary. Um, and then we see that there's just no space for recognition of trans and non-binary people. Um, so organizations have really been pushing to include trans identities and gender identity um, to be named as um, a factor to be protected. Uh, so Barbados for the first time in its history last year, um, passed a non-discrimination bill which named sexual orientation as a grounds for protection and that was a really big deal um, and it was on the basis of employment so now it's illegal to discriminate against somebody because of their sexual orientation when it comes to employment but it didn't say anything about gender identity um, so we find that that happens often even though even if there's progress being made it's just progress for a tiny piece of people um, and it's not fair because trans people are the ones who are really pushing to make progress. Um, so I think there just needs to be a lot more of an intersectional approach and um, yeah, an inclusive approach to the work that's being done. And it is happening slowly but surely, uh, but trans people deserve to live their lives free of violence and they deserve to be able to walk down the streets um, without being assaulted or attacked. Um, and something that we've been doing over the past few years as well is making sure that we have gender affirming care um, any services that we offer. Um, so She Barbados has also worked with the Barbados Family Planning Association and another organization called Equals to provide um, safe access to sexual and reproductive services. Um, and we really push to make sure that gender affirming services, whether it be access to um, hormone replacement therapy or mental health care, or just like general um, physical health, um, we made sure that we continue to push that this is trans inclusive um, because quite often trans people face even more barriers to accessing services. For example, if they go to a public clinic, they can't even make it inside because the security guard is at the front asking them if they're a man or a woman. Um, and it's just ridiculous, you know, a lot of the time they can't make reports at a police station because the police are laughing at them and subjugating them even more. And what happens is a lot of people leave the country um, and are moving to the US, to Canada, to the UK. And then they're coming over to these countries and experiencing racism that they didn't experience at home. Um, so it becomes a double-edged sword. Um, so yeah, I think what needs to happen is trying to make sure that trans people feel included within the movement and um, feel affirmed in their citizenship and their right uh, to be in their countries. And I think we're getting there slowly but surely. Thanks, Rowan. A um, lot to think about there. Um, you mentioned the IACHR, so actually that makes me want to go to Larissa. Um, so your country led on a, a big uh, 
decision of the court uh, a couple of years ago, which of course had implications for the broader movement uh, for marriage and so on. But I'm wondering, um, you know, we've yet to see that decision implemented or used really as precedent anywhere else um, in the region or the signatories of the of the convention. Um, but I am wondering, um, have you been able to leverage that in any way for protections for trans people and what is the state of um, play in your country? Yes, indeed. Well, with the advisory opinion uh, 24 of the Inter-American Court, we were able to um, achieve equal marriage, but also to uh, achieve the the right for or to um, yeah to recognize the right of trans people to be able uh, to change their names to correspond with their gender identity but at this point they are not able to change uh, their sex assign at birth on their ids and um and, and that has been like a, a big challenge even though the or the um advisory opinion says they should be able or there should be a allowed to change uh, the sex assigned at birth. So that is something that is not happening by now. Um, and also I would like to address other issues regarding that because sometimes we, um, as I said before, like we made everything uh, like turn around the equal marriage, but there are a lot of other issues and problems like hate crimes, uh, especially for trans women that are sex workers, all the violence they live, um, not just from society and the state, but also because they're sex workers or forced to be sex workers, corrective rapes, hate speech. And those are um, issues or problems that have not been addressed um, at this point. 2020 20 in, in Costa Rica. And um, I believe one of the main problems we're having is that the international uh, projection of Costa Rica is that we are a country that respects human rights, that has like a, a proper legal frame to protect uh, human rights. And to be honest, that is not especially the case or is not quite right, especially now after the presidential elections and uh, the person that has been elected president has said that he will um, like delete everything uh, regarding what, a, what has been called gender ideology. That is basically everything related to sexual and reproductive rights, discrimination based on gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. So at this point, we are fearing that not only we will not be able to overcome the problems that we had already, but we might um, have some sort of uh, backlash and we will lose whatever we had. I know it's um, it's hard because, I mean, um, the legal frame is not something you can manipulate and uh, delete it like right away, but we will know that the violence um, from society, from the state might uh, go higher and higher and especially in a country where the, the funding is not really available and maybe we don't have the technical tools and it, it is not something that the world is expecting. I'm very, very afraid uh, for what is about to, to come. We don't know what will happen if we, um, because we have seen in other countries such as Paraguay, for example, where the term gender is not even allowed to be said in any uh, document from the state. So it's, uh, <laughs> we'll have to see, but right now we're trying to um, organize things so we can at least not lose whatever is that we won already. Well, thank you and good luck with that. Um, we are coming to the end. We have one more speaker on this topic. And then I'm just going to give you all a heads up. After that, I want to do a quick one round, one sentence for, from each of you for your hopes for the next year your hopes and your dreams for the upcoming year. So think about that. Um, Danny, well, if you very briefly, if you don't mind, answer the question, um, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, I sent a link to uh, 
a bill that's been discussed regarding stating trans identity as a disorder that has implications in education, schools, and media, and also like the state discourse regarding this. And I wanted to tell that there's a lot of issues. Um, people can, you know, present as they are in their identity documents, but we don't have gender marker and other legal recognitions. And one of the main problems is that uh, also because of our past, a lot of issues has been raised are always, you know, related to STD prevention and never to actual recognition of civil rights. So that's why we founded this organization and that that's the work we've been doing. In 2018, I tried, I presented in Congress with some Congress people, a law that will uh, add to our current anti-discrimination law, gender identity, but that didn't pass. And we have had a lot of uh, trials at it. We're trying now for addressing it more by litigation so we can, you know, connect it to the advisory opinion we were discussing it before, but it's a challenge that we have. And in that sense, I, I will just like to say that my that I expect uh, for more openness in the conversation and for media to be fair with LGBT people, because I think that we at times really fall into the narrative game uh, that people that are against us uh, play. And we need to be better and not fall into the game they set for us. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, of course, we could go on for hours. I mean, this is a remarkable conversation. I, and I really, I want to thank each of you for opening up and, and sharing with us. Um, so as I said, let's just go around and let's share our hopes for the next year in one sentence or less. Um, why don't, uh, Dominique, why don't you start us off? Uh, it's very limited, one sentence, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what, are, what I wish for, for the, 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 the and uh, we are working toward that goal, is at least to provide the support of, uh, and the possibility for transgender person in AT to be able to at least start their uh, gender identity recognition process. And... I don't know. We are, we, we are trying to find a path for that, and that is one of my hope for the next year. Well, we're all with you on that one. We stand behind you, Rowan. I have so many wishes. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to put it into one sentence. Um, but I think concisely, I would say that I, I wish and I hope for people on all levels, at an institutional level, but also at a general societal level, to stop being afraid of diversity, because I feel that that is at the root of a lot of the issues that we're facing. Um, stop being afraid of diversity and celebrate each other for our differences and recognize the humanity of LGBT people. Thank you. Uh, Larissa. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. I have so many hopes. It's impossible that we should have like another hour just for that. But I'm just gonna um, mention uh, changes uh, about two issues that I have not yet um, uh, raised. Um, and it's to overcome the recognition of conscious objection for any state representative uh, regarding uh, LBGQIQ plus rights. And that is something that has been uh, recognized in Costa Rica. Like uh, and that means like any state representative can say, I'm not gonna do uh, anything related to mm -hmm. a person's uh, um, LBGQIQ plus. And the other one is uh, to achieve um, a framework for protection to human rights defenders, especially in a context where we are fearing more violence because we don't have anything related to that. So I think uh, those would be like my two main hopes uh, about issues that I had not talked before. Thank you. And finally, but not least, briefly, Danny. I think that uh, my hope is that we can also see how this interconnects to things in general and 
so we can see us as part of society and that society can see us as an integral part. And we came up with this thing that the society loses every time we lose. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, I, I want our societies to win more. <laughs> Tired of seeing our societies losing. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. We all want to see our societies benefit from treating us with more dignity, more respect, celebrating who we are, engaging with us, including us, and allowing us to bring our full and wonderful selves to the societies in which we live. Um, I want to thank each one of you um, for being here, for being part of this program. I want to thank Stephanie and Maggie for the amazing work that you're doing um, at Columbia in providing the resources and support to bring these advocates together so that we can have these kind of exchanges. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet everybody and to um, host this amazing panel. And so with that, thank you to everyone who's joined us for the hour, for staying with us, for asking your questions, and for being part of this amazing conversation. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Till next time. Bye. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>